So welcome to our first Fall Women's Leadership Forum, and this forum is called A Bolder Way Forward for Utah. And I'm Dr. Susan Madsen, founding director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, and I'm also the Karen Haid Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. And I'm the host today. I'll do a little presenting, and then um, we'll also have a panel and more of a conversation here and there with my dear friends who are joining me today. I'll introduce them in just a minute. So this event furthers the mission of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, which is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. And we serve Utah and its residents by first, producing relevant, trustworthy, applicable research, second, creating and gathering valuable resources, and third, convening trainings and events that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Utah Education Network, UEN, for their work with our video editing and particularly um, also want to thank uh, some of our Boulder Way Forward funders, including founding funders, Zions Bank, Cambia Health Foundation, Utah State University, and the Utah State Legislature. And then we also have received support from Larry H. and Gail Miller Family Foundation, Beasley Family Foundation, as well as some others. So today's panel will focus on a new initiative for Utah called A Boulder Way Forward. Now the formal launch was on June 9th and that was hosted by Zions Bank. And many people were unable to attend that launch. It filled up and many had vacations. Um, so we wanted another opportunity for people like you to hear about the framework and to learn more about how to get involved. So there will be time for questions from you listening. So submit your questions anytime, either in the chat, that'll get, us, get them to the three of us, um, but also in the Q&A. So to get us started today, I would like to introduce my panelists and my friends. So Nubia Pena is a senior advisor for equity and opportunity to the governor, um, to Governor Cox Henderson administration. And she's also the director for the Utah Division of Multicultural Affairs. She received her Juris Doctorate from the University of Utah in 2016. And she was one of 25 law students in the nation recognized for her social justice activism. Director Pena received the National Juvenile Justice Network in 2019 uh, Emerging Leader Award. And she's also certified by the National Juvenile Defender Center as a Juvenile Training Immersion Program Facilitator. Nubia, always nice to have you here. So <laughs> good to have you here. Um, Jennifer Smith is Zions Bank Corporation Chief Technology and Operations Officer and member of the company's executive committee. Jennifer was recently awarded YWCA of Utah's Outstanding Leadership Award in Social and Business Innovation, honored as one of American's Bankers Most Powerful Women and won the Women's Tech Council's Technology Leadership Award and she holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from the University of Utah, and she serves on many university uh, community and nonprofit boards. So welcome to both of you. And, and what is awesome about being with both of you is there, that you're not just professionals that I know, but you're also friends. So thank you for joining us today. So my opening question is, you know, I'm in just a minute, and, and many listening may have heard me give my 15-minute spiel on the Boulder Way Forward. I'm going to do that in a minute. But before I do that, um, I would love to have both of you share your thoughts and insights on why you believe this movement, and I called it an, an initiative, but it's a movement as well, is so really critical for Utah right now. Nubia, would you get us started? 
Absolutely. And welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you could tune in for this discussion and so grateful to be a part of this as long, along with Jennifer. And so from the Cox Henderson administration, we are fully committed to making the type of state that everyone who calls Utah home is able to thrive. And so when we look at the data sets that your research presents all along the various spokes that I know that you'll unpack here in just a moment, we recognize that there are great opportunities to address the disparities faced by women in Utah from sexual violence, domestic assault, housing, mental health access, medical care, workforce development, leadership skills, opportunities to, again, have access to upward mobility, we recognize that this is going to take collective movement, traction, engagement, and collaboration, because it is not just one organization that can lift the solutions. And so this is, again, a call to action to the folks on the call today, but it really has been a beautiful initiative that is inviting people in and saying, how can we do better for women and girls? Not to the exclusion of our boys and men. I think it's really important for me to say that because I think oftentimes when we have these discussions, it's almost as if we're saying we're going to champion one and erase the other. And that's not what this is about. We know that we're going to need everyone to engage in the solutions that make this a great state for women and also for men and for people who identify on multiple aspects of, of their identity. So again, so exciting to be a part of this conversation. The Cox Henderson team is committed, again, to making sure that we partner through private and public sector and find the solutions that are going to strengthen Utah. Thank you so much. Jennifer, same question. Uh, thank you, Susan. First, thank you for having me. It's so fantastic to be here with you and Nubia. Also mentioned Nubia was recognized by the w YWCA yes, uh, as true. when I was. So um, just wanted to call call her great work out. Um, the uh, first, why is this important to me? Um, it's it, it's you know for all of us it's it's often personal and uh, we look you know we may look around and feel disappointed on occasion that um, a woman's voice may not be in the room or in uh, or represented enough in the the halls of of congress or in other places and uh but why is that so important why is this initiative so important at this point in time i don't know about all of you but the last few years have been hard mm -hmm. um we've I think we have we have recognized the pain that many suffer broadly in our communities, in Utah, nationally, even even globally. We've become more and more aware of the challenges that we all have to address. And let's also just be as part of that. Those changes, those challenges can't be addressed if we don't, if, we're, if women are not participating, we have this call to action to make our communities better and to be present for those who are striving to do something differently and to contribute. And we know, our families know, our community knows that results are better when everybody who is impacted by a situation, voices are heard. And those outcomes are better for families. They're better for communities that shows up in statistics. This isn't just, it feels good. It's that our state, our communities, our nation needs us to stand, to stand up, to participate and change outcomes. Because you know, right now we're at a pivotal point in history where we can make a difference. So I think, Susan, that's why I think it's so important at this point to engage. And then just locally, it feels better when we all, you know, when we see people like us in um, various forums as well. I love that. Thank you so much. And so um, Zions Bank and uh, Zions Bank Corporation have been key partners as well as the Cox Henderson administration. And so that's the reason I asked Nubia and Jennifer to join me today. I do want to say that we have other partners 
um, as well that are in, I mentioned some of them, but I'll tell you to make the Boulder Way Forward work in Utah, we will need hundreds, if not thousands of organizations of all kinds to come on board. And, uh, and any time during this presentation, if you want to get on the internet and search a boulderwayforward.org and see, and I'll guide you a little bit later on some, some pages so you know where to find things and where you're going to be able to see changes and so forth. So what I'd like to do, and I'd like you two to keep your cameras on because I may jump over to you, is now to give you, and some of you may have heard this, but many of you have not, I'm going to give you just a quick overview. So we're looking at the word, a bolder way forward, and I added many settings for Utah, right? It's a bolder way forward for Utah. So let me give you some background. I'm going to share my screen and walk through some slides um, to help you visualize what is happening and what we are looking at. So I'm so pleased to tell you about this movement called A Bolder Way Forward. In fact, uh, just a couple of months ago, June 9th, uh, we did have the launch and, um, and just had a wonderful time and lots of people were involved there. So we were excited to be able to do that in partnership with Science Bank. So just a little bit of history here. So personally, me personally, in 2022, I have to say it was a restless year for me in considering ways that we can shift things for Utah girls and women faster. And I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. My staff, but so many other women's groups and organizations and other folks as well. So many of our partners and collaborators in Utah are feeling the same way. So what we know is this. National and statewide studies continue to show that women and girls in Utah are not thriving in critical areas. So year after year, Utah continues to have high levels of domestic violence, sexual assault, child sexual abuse, and gender-based discrimination, while also ranking as the worst state for women's equality and having low levels of women's leadership representation in nearly all domains, including business and politics. Now, the needle has moved slightly, I will say ever so slightly, <laughs> in a few areas. And even with that, what we know, though, is it's going to take two, three, four decades at the rate we're going to make any notable progress. I mean, we, we are seeing some slight progress, but I, and I really hadn't thought of this until um, just last fall. Um, I had looked at trajectories through my global work uh, with in work I've done with the United Nations, European Union. We look at trajectories, but for the first time in August and in, in November of 2022, we really thought through the research here and, say, and looked at, you know, it's going to take too long to make at the rate we're going, even though there's good things happening. It is going to make you know, take too long. And to me, two decades is too long, three decades is way too long, and four decades is too is definitely too long. And as I work on this, I think often of my own daughter. I have three sons and one daughter, and then my granddaughter Hadley. And last week, my daughter had twins. And so she has James and Had and and Savannah now. So as I think about my own daughter and granddaughters, I think about I, I need need Utah. Even though I love being a woman, I love living in Utah. There are things that need to change, and I want to do that sooner than later. So we are all saying it's time for Utah to embrace a bolder way forward. Because when we lift Utah girls and women we lift all Utahns, and that means boys and men as well. So if we are serious about ensuring that Utah girls and women thrive, we need to create change much faster. And so the Boulder Way Forward says, we're gonna create bold change by 2030 with the checkpoint in 2026. And this includes making bold goals for all of you know, each of our those two years, 2026, 2030, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. It also means shifting from just measuring outputs, what we do, what we offer to outcomes, what's going to actually change. 
Um, and, and so instead of just measuring the stuff we do and what we accomplish, we want to focus now on the changes in society. And that's really an important element moving forward. And so this is what happened in late October. Um, I was on two flights to Costa Rica, two flights back, and that the my flights are the time that I'm able to read books. And I, even though I've studied societal change for decades, I had never read this book. Now, do you see this? <laughs> um, it is called How Change Happens, Why Some Social Movements Succeed and While Others Do Not. And I just had so many ahas reading that. And the authors and researchers, what they did was really deeply study social change movements in the United States that had been very successful, like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, like Gay Marriage, uh, National Rifle Association, the tobacco. I mean, younger in my, you know, in my youth, people were smoking all over the United States and that has changed. And then the researchers compared those movements with movements that had just not made a difference. I mean, they hadn't moved things, even if they had a lot of money, they still were not moving the needle. And they came up with, even though everybody did, you know, things in different ways and in a little bit different models, there were some key things that were very, very similar. And of course, that was a whole book and we just have a few minutes to go through this. And so I would strongly recommend that you read that book if you're interested in leaning in and engaging and being part of the solution. I would really recommend that. So what is uh, this model you may be thinking? By the way, I wish I could see all of you. I like presenting to audiences where I can see faces and so forth. But what this really looks at is systems thinking. And I was trained on this in my doctoral program. Um, and, and really to do that, we need to utilize systems thinking, which is really the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Now systems are made up of interrelated interdependent parts, but they can't be understood as a function of isolated pieces and parts. Now, although each part needs to be working well, a system can't be understood by only focusing on pieces and parts. As I said, it needs to consider the relationship between the parts so that all work together for more powerful results and in more powerful ways. And that is really the key to more boldly advancing a common cause. Now I need to say that in Utah, we have been, we're not starting from scratch. We have been working really hard Many, not just my organization, not just, you know, and I mean, there's many women's groups and different things, but so many have been working, but we have done it through the part strategy. And what the, the researchers found in this book that they published, they talked about, that's really the difference between the movements in the United States that have actually worked and those that didn't, is that they use this systems thinking and not just had people work in the parts, but somehow brought that work together, even though organizations will still have their own missions and goals, there's a connection that we work together for this common cause, and that really is the key. So um, according to the research, successful movement leaders bring diverse coalitions together. They act as part of, they bring the organizations to be part of a a bigger network and we're connected, not one directing, but just communicating, collaborating in better ways. And you know what? It, I mean, in the book, they call it networked leadership. It's leading from the middle, bringing the efforts and initiatives and voices together. And that really is the key. Now, what I want now is to just tell you a little bit about this model. And then Jennifer and Nubia, I would love to have you pop in and share some of your insights. And so, as I said, I was reading this book, Two Flights to Costa Rica, Two Flights Back. By the time I landed in Salt Lake, um, it, there's something about being trapped on a plane where you can't do much else. And so you reflect and you journal. And and um, and for me, you know, I received some good inspiration on planes. Um, but by the time I landed, really the name and the model, and I thought we would change the visual, but it's kind of stuck 
right? So this is what uh, we're going with. So again, the Boulder Way Forward framework is here. So lots of programs, initiatives, efforts, we, you know, have been done. And we've been working on that and there's things going on. But we really look at this, this is an uphill road for girls and women in the state of Utah. And um, the efforts we've been really, including the work that my team and I are doing, have been filling in the potholes uh, to make the road smoother. And that's important. I think that's led to where we're at now. But this is our wheel of change. And we really believe that this will has not started moving up the hill and we need to get up the hill and we need to, um, to really shift things in bold ways for girls and women. And so that's what the model is, is this will of change. And um, as we were thinking about this model, we thought, well, there's many good things happening, but we're not shifting together. But do we just choose one? like Mothers Against Drunk Driving did or whatever, all those are important, or do we unite the forces and say all of these things on this chart are critical and important, there's things being done, can we unite and actually be working in more powerful ways with all of these? So if you can see here, I'll start with safety and security. So we have five main categories, but we are calling each of these bulleted, there's 18, spokes. So these are the spokes. And so you can see, I don't want to go through all of these um, with you. I don't have time to do that because I want to take questions and hear from Jennifer and, and Nubia as well. But you'll see child sexual abuse is one of them. That is so key. There's so much we could say on every one of these issues. But what I love about this model is that we're not starting from scratch that we're pulling in the organizations and some of the spoke, we're calling them spoke leaders. Some of the spoke leaders may be um, listening in today, um, but we're pulling in the spoke leaders and the organizations that are already doing work. We just have not supported each other in ways that we need to support each other to shift things forward. So for instance, the child sexual abuse, Sapria Maloof Foundation and Prevents Child Abuse uh, Utah, um, are the partners here, but they're inviting anyone else, all the organizations doing the work in, and even individuals that want to lean in and say, I want to use my voice, I want to do something to move things forward. Domestic violence, we have partners there, uh, the, the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition and, and, um, and a few others, poverty and homelessness, sexual assault, sorry if Spoke leaders are listening in, and I'm not giving everybody credit here. Um, sexual harassment and gender-based discrimination. You look here, community engagement spoke. This one actually has three subspokes, which are political representation. Number two is boards and commissions, and three is civic engagement and ag advocacy. If you look over here in education, and do you see I have dotted lines? I have a. <laughs> That means they interact with each other. For instance, finance, we know there's a direct connection between finance, feeling like you, you understand money and have some control of money and your decision if you're in a domestic violence relationship to lead. And finance relates to higher education attainment and K through 12 um, initiatives. Uh, workplace spokes, as, as you can see, uh, child care, entrepreneurship, uh, gender pay gap, uh, leadership development, organizational strategies and workplace culture, STEM fields, uh, workplace or workforce development. And then last but not least at all, health and well-being. We have health across the lifespan and are just pleased to have um, uh, Intermountain Healthcare be one of our anchors, uh, University of Utah Health, and then um, uh, Cambia Health Foundation is very engaged with Regents Blue Cross Blue Shields in that spoke as well. And then uh, home and family. I'll tell you, that is so important to me. It, my belief system, but also, you know, I chose to stay at home. I have four children of my own and stay at home. And, and that is so important, equality and marriage and so many things. So this model is not only for women who work for pay, but it's for women who choose to stay at home. It's for girls 
to prepare, you know, for leadership roles and engage in different ways. It's for families, uh, community. It's it's not just people that go to work, um, you know, in 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 a box. And it's for everybody, right? This is what we want. We want to lift everybody. So before I finish my little presentation, uh, I would love to have Jennifer's. I'll start with you. Please, uh, in fact, let me stop sharing my screen for a minute so I can see you better. Um, and again, everybody else, um, if you want to have this model in front of you when I'm not sharing, just go to a bolderwayforward.org. And on that page, you can click right on that model. So Jennifer, here's my question to you. So it is bold, right, to take on all 18 spokes at once. But why do you think it's important for us to just take on? I mean, it's very bold, right? People tell me that all the time. It's so bold. I'm like, yeah. I think. Bold, bold is a fantastic adjective to use for uh, this, this work. And Susan, I just had to show you. This was on my bookshelf. I've read it. I just pulled it down so you... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, I did my homework, Professor. Don't you think it's it was a it's, helpful book to see? So see help, oh, helpful, helpful. Yeah. And you know, um, I have to admit, when I oh, Stumbia <laughs> has hers. She just shared with us too. Um, when uh, Susan first shared this many, many months ago, um, the kind of driver, high performance leader, kind of this in many of us. I'm like, whoa. That's a lot. Can't we just focus? It's a lot. Why don't we just have one or three or five? And uh, that is actually the tendency we all are going to have to watch because many of us are in organizations where you're like, tell me the goals. Tell me uh, what uh, you're going to achieve when. And it's almost like we want to operate in an environment where there's no complexity. But the reality is we operate, we operate in complexity. I mean, this quite, you know, this, this problem has been building around women's equality for thousands and thousands of years. Yes, so yes. Um, and we have to move quickly too. Um, but so I actually, real, real quick, each spoke impacts another spoke. So taking them just one or whatever is not even as efficient. <laughs> yeah, back yeah, to you. That, that interplay between them, I mean, we can we can take one, but we actually aren't going to to address the broader issue because the fact is, is we are operating in a lot of complexity. Is I mean, we all feel it. We all know we're operating in that complexity, and being able to recognize that that is where we're at, and some of these folks may be able to get really refined in some of that goal setting at a detailed level and that will help lift this all up. But um, yeah, like I said, I was intimidated at first and then taking a step back and looking at the interplay by not looking at the whole, how can you address a problem if you don't understand the whole? And so that's why I think this approach is really important and it might be a little counter to some of us uh, I'll just speak from corporate America of how we might tackle some problems. I love that. Thank you so much. And and uh, I'll tell you, um, there is work happening on all 18 already. So who do you leave out when they're all connected in so many ways? So Nubi, I wanted to bring you in in just a minute after I explained the rim but wanted you to, any comments before we do that on, on yes. what we're talking about? Yes, no, absolutely. And thank you so much, Susan. I do want to acknowledge we have a couple of chat um, yeah. responses in the chat. And so Carrie Van Wagner, congratulations on almost being done with your MPH. Um, they just mentioned that, you know, in a couple of spaces, they've noticed that the lack of systems thinking is alarming mm -hmm. because when we are working in isolation of thinking about how this system of interconnected aspects that impact all of our lives. When you pull on one thread, it's going to tug on something else. When we're thinking about domestic violence, we have to discuss the availability of affordable mental health. 
When we're thinking about leadership development, we have to think about the amount of potential barriers within workplaces that amplify sexism, right? So every single thing touches on one another, and it's critical for us to have this larger picture discussion. Um, I also want to acknowledge that Trisha Reynolds mentioned um, she'd love to see the discussion around incarceration. And that's something I know for me, I'm deeply passionate about as a former juvenile defender. We have to talk about our kids in the system. We have to talk about those that are, are currently incarcerated and got there through various pathways because of trauma, because of addiction, because of harm in their, in their childhood. So again, every single spoke is critical and necessary. So not only is this bold, it is needed. Not only is everyone on this call necessary, but we also have to pause and think about the weight of knowing that not every woman, is, we are not a monolith. Right. We have to then start to peel back the layers, because when we talk about the wage gap, women of color are disproportionately impacted. When we talk about incarceration, we have women who are cognitively and neurodiverse who have been potentially left out of these discussions, right? Um, so again, I can add more, but I just wanted to say, I appreciate Jennifer's comment. This has to be a full systems approach. It's interconnected and we need all of the spokes for the discussion. Thank you so much. So I'll, I'll take us just a little bit further on this model and then I'll come back to you too. Thank you so much. And so we've walked through, and I hope all of you can look at the various pages. I'll walk you through the website in just a second to see all of our wonderful spoke leaders, um, the organizations that are supporting uh, from state government to nonprofits to businesses are coming on board. Um, I, in fact, yesterday I was just out at Northrop Grumman, way out. I was surprised at how far out it was. And they're, they're definitely uh, so, so uh, they, they want to lean in even with their organization and see how they can help and, and train their own employees. So this is what I want to talk about next. So we have this wheel of change. We have these 18 spokes in these five chunks. Are you following me? Everybody, I can't see your faces, but hopefully everybody's following. But we also have the rims. Now there are things, and you mentioned a couple, Nuvia. There are struggles and challenges and issues that impact every single spoke. And so to address that, we have these four, and then I'll show you a screen in just a minute to, to get deeper on what which ones we have here that really move into everything. S understanding sexism is one of those, right? The male allyship, oh my gosh, you two could talk about that too. I've heard you on how important having men engaged. Women can't do it all alone, but more and more Utah men are saying, wait, this is so important for our employees, but also for their daughters, for their neighbors. And, and we need to, and a lot of men, I have to say, Jennifer and Nubia, and you probably heard this too. I've had a lot of men that really desire to lean in and, and are like, I'm not sure what a male allyship or male ally does. And I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to do more. So also um, identity and culture. And so we're starting to, well, some of them have been formed already, but we're starting what we're calling, these are spokes right spokes and we have working groups within the spokes and you can we're going to be updating the web pages and so forth these we're calling impact teams so and of course the middle goal is helping more girls and women thrive and when i give you a couple of slides to finish it off i'll give you a little bit more here and so these rims are so important let me stop sharing my screen for just a minute actually i think i could do it without that let me go back and there we go. So, so our impact teams, we actually under, do you remember back on that? There's sexism, male allyship, and then identity and culture. So under, if you look at this, under identity, we are just now getting formed a, and you can click on, click on the picture when we have enough information. Um, one on age, especially focused on more senior women and some of the struggles um, that impact all 18 of the spokes. You can see under our culture, um, 
we have an arts and music. Back under identity, we have a disabilities. We just formed that, just getting that ready. That, that will go live in a couple of days. Back under culture, we have a, the just the start of an interfaith. You can see I'm back under, I'm going yo-yo, back and forth. Under um, identity, we have an LGBTQ. And again, the organizations that are, are already doing the work are being, are, are absolutely saying we want to be engaged because this aligns with their work. Male allyship is one on the will. Under identity, we have a neural equality. We have a great race and ethnicity impact team that's just forming under identity as well. We have refugees and immigrants. We have uh, the sexism and then another identity. And this may be new to Jennifer and, and uh, Nubia, but we have one just forming now, have one of the co-leads on veteran and, and, and service women. And, and these are volunteers who are leading these. Right. And so if there are ones like like um, incarceration that you just talked about, Nubia, um, if there are people that want to co-lead uh, such an impact team, absolutely. That's a population that's forgotten many times. And we're just so happy to partner with Better Days and some other folks on women's history. So those are a few things that I think are just so important to think about in terms of moving the movement forward. So if you go back Susan, here, you can see, oh yes. It's, it's a couple of questions coming in as we talk about Great. about culture. I would love to throw them at you. There, uh, I'm gonna share a couple of them okay. that Great. are um, at, it, it, it relates to religion. And uh, I think you could give a great perspective on this. So one is just simply about um, that a big impact on gender norms in the state of Utah is uh, the role of religion and maybe a patriarchal nature. Um, and then there's an other uh, question, uh, similar, a similar question um, that is uh, really related to how, um, you know, with the Mormon church being such a heavy influence in Utah, how do we engage uh, with, you know, with that faith and, and other faiths too. So um, a lot of the Excellent. different angles on that. On these that comes up every day in. for me. Yeah. Every day. Um, and, and what's important is, is some of, you know, us living in Utah have experienced that um, and know what we're talking about. Yeah, we love living in Utah and there's, there's some, some struggles there. But also when you look at the research around, really, you know, religion, religious societies and so forth, what we see in terms of sexism, what we see in terms of even research around the gap, pay gap and other things are pretty consistent with more religious societies. We're not the only state and we're not the only country. Um, and so it's interesting to look at our situation, but also compare it to some of the literature. So back to those of you that asked that question, and 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 it's it's a question that people from inside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints ask, but also people that are are not maybe uh, participating in the religion and or, or people of any faith, right? How do we wrestle with this? More religious societies tend to have more sexism. Not a big shock there, right? We tend to struggle with some of the things. So to me and to my team and others, it is important to engage. Uh, and hence, we have an interfaith where we'll start bringing together people of all religions. But just letting you know, there's um, we've I've had some really great discussions it, with various groups within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And one of the things that I've appreciated in those meetings is that um, Many of those conversations show such an overlap with concerns with the Church of Jesus Christ um, in terms of abuse and violence and harassment and poverty and homelessness and educated society and home and family and all of those things. So sometimes we think that a change is hitting heads with our predominant religion when in reality, I think there's a lot more connection 
but there's more intentional work that needs to be done. Because if we're not addressing more intentional and helping raise awareness of the biases that we have and how sexism works, for instance, I'm teaching almost every day what benevolent sexism looks like. And my own religion, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, actually, we do a lot of benevolent sexism, but people, it comes from this good place, but there's not an understanding of how that affects people. And so I, I'm kind of off. I don't want to take too much more time on this, but but just know that, yes, that is something that to me is critical in terms of, in, in my religion, but also other faiths as well. Nubia, you have been in this with me from the start. You and I have strategized weekly. Any thoughts you wanted to add with that? Because that's an important question. Absolutely, Susan. Thank you. And I just really appreciate the level of engagement that we've had in the chat. Thank you to all of our attendees that are so just leaning in to this discussion, right? What does it mean? What does it mean for us in Utah, where we have a very unique culture, right? And so uh, what you've mentioned, Susan, is that we cannot in any way pit one partner, one faith, one community leader against the other. It's going to take all of us. And so, you know, we, we've had women who are just like, well, I love my faith and I love my role as a mother. I love my role living, um, you know, having that identity as a stay at home. This feels like you're pushing us into the workforce. Mm. And what we want to really share is that this is about growing opportunities, not diminishing the value of women in the home or the women in the workforce, right? We are complex human beings. We can have multiple roles and we should be able to have the choice of how we engage. Now, when we're hearing from women telling us that they are choosing to stay at home because they can't afford childcare, that's a choice discussion. When they are telling us that they don't feel supported to be integrated in the workforce because there are companies that are not providing flexible work schedule, that's a choice issue. Right. So we are constantly having to live in the discussion, in the nuances of how do we grow choice? How do we not diminish the value of one versus the other? How do we create a different alternative to speaking about this? How do we challenge the scarcity mindset and really ensure that it is about abundance and growth and strategy that champions everyone in our state? And so I hope what you hear from us is that we are wanting to work with every partner that has a desire to see Utah be the best state in the nation for women and girls and for every person that is calling us home. And that's what I love. What I love about what you're sharing, too, is it goes back to Susan's earlier comments around looking at this as an entire system and that interplay between all of those choices that we make every day um, and the opportunity to um, just ensure that uh, we, we're removing the barriers from um, the barriers that women and families and um, uh, girls are facing in order for them to contribute in the way that they like. Uh, those are the kinds of things we can do when we think about this broadly as, as you saw so well uh, articulated so well. Thank you. To both of you, I do want to say something, that word choice, I love that word, but I also want to just mention that sometimes people, especially for like the gender wage gap, people say, well, that's women's choice. Mm. They're getting paid. So that word choice, sometimes um, girls, young women, don't think they have a choice to, to, aspire to get a bachelor's or a master's degree, or maybe they don't feel like they have a choice to go into a more um, non-traditional field. They don't know that they have a choice to negotiate because they've only seen men negotiate. And so that's part of the movement is more training and development. We want people to choose. And with that knowledge, then we need to respect the choices. And I chose to stay at home for many years raising kids. And it was tough. It was tough for me. Um, and then I chose after a few of those years, this, uh, it can't be all or nothing because I wasn't finding my, 
joy in, in domestic duties. <laughs> um, and so I chose to take a path that, that was a little mix of this and that and this and that. All of those things are important, but I will tell you just yesterday, I heard a woman say, it is not my role to use my voice and lean in and lead. And those messages came throughout her life. And I said to her, it is your role as a mother to lean in and lead. And so when there's messages given that girls and women should not do things and or boys and men, I'm just I'm just wrestling with that choice, right? And what what I know through all of this, and I loved both of your comments is that when it comes down to so many of these folks and the issues that we're talking about, some of this is unacceptable. The violence is unacceptable. The domestic violence is unacceptable. And I will do everything in my might to make this culture and this state be a better place for Savannah and Hadley, my two granddaughters. So. Thank you so much. I got off a little bit. You know, Jennifer and, and um, yeah, Nubia, I have to have a tear wherever I go, right? Um, so yeah, I love that. Really quickly, Susan, because I know we got to get back on track. But, um, you know, I also had a really beautiful experience yesterday where I had an opportunity to sit around the table with the tech moms. It was their first tech moms in Espanol experience where they're getting more women into STEM fields to think about opportunities, right, in the tech industry where it's high paying. So women can stop having to live paycheck to paycheck, especially for our single moms or for those that have big dreams about being a big innovator that is going to solve, um, you know, social and community ills and harms. And it was funny. It wasn't funny. I will, I will, I will equally share with you the pain that I felt, right? Um, in how women sometimes are afraid of their own power. And they 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 lean back because mm -hmm. they somehow haven't been encouraged. And so I think for me, Susan, what more than anything I want out of this call and for every single one that is listening please make sure that as you are engaging with women, we speak to their divine potential to leave this world better than we found it. Yes, I love that. That women are able to know that because we are different, we think differently, right? We are all, again, we're not the monolith, but because of our diverse experiences and how we were raised or what we love or what we're passionate about or the things that are our holy fire and righteous indignation, mm -hmm. that we actually have the solutions for many of these gaps in our world. Thank you. And I shared one quick quote that was really powerful. And I do hope that we think about this, but Les Brown once said that the graveyard is the richest place on earth because it is here that you will find all of the hopes and the dreams that were never fulfilled. The books that were never written, the songs that were never sung, the inventions that were never shared, the cures that were never discovered, all because someone was too afraid to take that first step keep with the problem or determined to carry out their dream. So to the women on the call, to those that are listening, dream, dream boldly and help us make this place better for our baby girls. Oh my gosh. You and I are just like, oh, we're all <laughs> crying. We all <laughs> apologize either y'all. This is hard. Like we truly <laughs> love our community. We I, truly it, love our community. So it is, it is, um, so important, what you said is so important. And I will tell you the only reason me personally, I'm doing this work is I feel called. I feel called to do it. And I believe um, I, <laughs> I'm seeing some of the, the messages pop through. And so I, I say to you, whether you're faith-based, whether you're religious, whether you're not, we can all feel called, right? And I hope there's men on the call too. We can all feel called in our way. But be, before we kind of jump over, I've just got a little bit to finish and then we're gonna take more questions. I just wanna have you think of it, just for those of you that have to pop out a little bit early maybe, I, I, we wanna do a call, a call to action, right? And what is that call? Well, look at our website, think about it. Um, I'll show you, you know, some things in a minute, but we do have um, these cards, any conference or any place um, that you, 
you are at. We'd love to get you some of these cards so you can start spreading them around and give you the resources so you can tell others in your neighborhoods, in your homes. Let's start in your homes, right? In your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your church congregations and, and businesses or whatever it is. So, all right, let me share my screen and give a couple more slides in here. And then um, uh, I'm just inspired by my two, uh, two friends here on the call and so many of you making comments. So here's where we're at. And so think about these, you know, 18 spokes Think about the the rim work. Think about some of these kinds of things and where do you want to engage? And I would say there's places for all of us. So a few things to conclude um, my little presentation piece. So the overarching goal of the Boulder Way for it is to make Utah a place where more girls and women can thrive in any setting, the, the home, workplace, congregations, communities. Uh, uh, and there's really not one metric that can say we've arrived, you know, that we can say, um, th that can really assess and measure the overarching goal. And so my team, we're working with all the spoke leaders to craft those and, and half of them are online and the other half should be coming on this week or next to craft the 2026 and 2030 goals for each of the areas linked to measurable outcomes. And if there's anybody on here that's a Professor, doing work, we we have found that there's a lot of gaps in trying to measure some of the things that we want to measure. So we can use a lot of help on the research side too. Now to do this, we're upscaling our work and locating, tracking, and, and trying to find those state metrics and others, the spoke leaders are working in that area. Um, and we will be starting in the next month to develop dashboards, visual dashboards on all of these so that we can see progress in the next seven years. And so we'll have on the UWLP site, the Utah Women in Leadership Project site, and that app, that URL is utwomen.org, we'll have that. And you know, through finding, collecting, and visualizing data for each spoke, we can track those changes over time. And, and it, it really means um, that people from the community and businesses, we can all see what's happening and feel that progress to move towards change. So I tell you this comprehensive in-depth examination, I mean, none of this work has been done by um, any other state. And I'll, I'll tell you, we're gonna be the leaders. And I truly believe, and I, Jennifer, you've told me this too, and Nubia, that we can in Utah be a national leader in how to implement positive change. I do want to also say that this is not just one piece. So the solutions will be multifaceted. So public policy will be an important piece. More research will be an important piece. Developing resources, training and development, messaging and communication shifts, more mentoring and sponsorship, networking, phil philanthropy is gonna be important. And one of the most important pieces is really the grassroots involvement. And so that is, is really going to be key. So let me, before I do that, let me just um, look at the audience real quick. Just one more slide, I promise. But I want to give you a quick update on where we're at um, in, at the county level. So to change, it can't just be public policy. It just can't, it can't just be one thing. It's got to be many, many things. But we need to get down to every business in the state, every home, every community, every street to make this move. Hence, we need tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, to be engaged in this work, right? And so the next step our team is doing is we're creating county coalitions. And we have about seven of the 29 counties formed already. Next week, we're gonna be in St. George and Cedar City for Iron County and Washington County. Um, and so there is work at the county level that will embrace people at city and municipality levels as well. So that is just starting. So maybe you're on the call and think, well, I don't know if I want to do a whole state. Well, how about your city? How about your neighborhood? 
how about, you know, there's, there's so much work to be done. Um, so back here, so I can finish up here. Um, again, using this framework, unique, unique, unique framework, Utah can become a national leader in how to implement positive change. So um, Utah must do better to make sure, you know, everybody thrives. And I do love this quote, Melinda Gates once stated, if you wanna lift up humanity and empower women, it's the most comprehensive, pervasive, high leverage investment you can make in human beings. However, it's important that we have men and boys and lift all of us, right? Our vision is not to lift girls and women at the expense of boys and men. That's the scarcity mentality that Nubia mentioned. Instead, we believe there's enough for everyone through cooperation and collaboration, the abundance mentality. Because really when we strengthen Utah girls and women, we strengthen everyone. So um, I have one more quote I'm gonna save to the very end, but uh, my two panelists, have you seen some other, I'm looking at time, we have a little bit of time. Have you seen some other questions? Um, actually, before we do that, let me real quick, just take one minute and show people. So on the website, I've got things in front of my, there we go. Um, on our Utah Women in Leadership Project, or if you go to a abolderwayforward.org, you'll get right to this page. Here's the, the little message, you know, that I have on there, but you'll see that we actually have um, a survey right here. If you're interested in being engaged, you can click here and take this survey. We have some other things. If your business or your organization or your group wants to be engaged, even your neighborhood, you can complete this or contact us. But if you go up here, do you see you can get more information about all 18 spokes, the impact teams here, the interest survey is here as well, and some other information. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, definitely, um, you know, want that survey. Um, in fact, Jennifer, do you mind, um, I don't wanna click it here. Um, but do you mind going over to that survey and putting that in the- I would absolutely Thank be you. happy to do that. Thank you. So Nubia, you look like you were reading a couple of questions. Uh, questions for me or all, all three of us? Definitely for you. So uh, we've got a couple of folks asking about how do they get cards? They want to be able oh. to understand oh. how to request them. The other one is um, where can they go to receive talking points? They said they want to do this project justice, but they are a little worried okay. that they're not LDS and also not from Utah, that it might be hard to help people understand how we're making sure it's not um, isolating partners, but really wanting to bring folks along. And then the third question oh, is, about how let, me, can... let me get to that real quick before you sure. go to the third. Just well, I have so... seven more, so yeah. <laughs> so on this same page here, there's a link to the survey here. I think it's over here too. But right here, we have a three page document that really has the the bolder way forward. Some of the language that I'm using here, it's just it's it's two pages plus the model. So a little more of a description here. Those tools I just mentioned, links to the book right here. Um, and so let me, I'll grab that and and hopefully put it over when I've got some window shut over into the chat. Um, and so that these are great talking points. But if you also go over to about and team, you can see my team here and reach out to any of us there. So Nubia, what was that last piece? Women are interested in knowing how they can get involved. They're saying that they wanna be involved at the county level, but that they're potentially also interested in co-leading. One of our partners on the call said that they are interested in helping champion incarcerated women. Oh, so good. So there's a lot of folks that are saying they want to show up and be a part of this. So more information would be great. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for adding the survey in the link. Um, yes. So, so far right now, those were the questions that were lifted. Oh, one more, actually, that was really important. Um, because our, our attendees can't see each other's chats, 
um, Sarah asked, you know, how can we make sure that we are sharing messages around the need for flex schedules, accessible quality childcare, and make sure that we're changing the narrative that this is not a woman's issue, it's a people's issue. Because until then, women will continue to be seen as less valuable in the workplace and society. Um, would you like to talk about the 100 companies championing women and our commitment to helping elevate the Okay, you well, then that. <laughs> And I mean, me too. So yes, um, the 100 Companies Championing Women Initiative was something that Susan and I, as we were discussing all of the great companies that in fact are doing this, are creating flexible schedules so that more women can enter the workforce and not feel the need to choose between family and a career, as well as childcare availability, on-site options, and leadership development and mentorship. We wanted to help tell the story of the great companies in Utah that were in fact getting behind women to make sure that we were elevating them as leaders in our state. And so we launched the 100 Companies Championing Women Initiative in partnership with the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. If you are a company that has more than 10 women, or I'm sorry, more than 10 employees and are doing your role and doing your part in creating the type of space that is making sure women can thrive from leadership, board representation, addressing the pay gap, we would love to honor you. We had our first and inaugural event a couple of, uh, I believe it was two months ago, where we celebrated the 100 companies and the governor was in attendance to celebrate and really acknowledge that we have great people leading in our corporate sector, in our nonprofits, and in our small entrepreneurs that want to make sure that we're growing opportunities. So if you want more information, go to the governor's office of economic opportunity website and nominate your, uh, your company or your nonprofit if you're able to. That's a awesome. lot it. And there's so many resources. It's like you practice that, Nubia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really passionate about it. <laughs> and and it, Jennifer, anything coming up for you in yeah, questions yeah. or things that have come to your mind? Yeah, I you, there's the I'm just sitting with this idea around call, that call to action. You spoke about it. Nubia talked about like this. You know, really, I just heard when she she was talking about that divine, what's in us that we need to share, I would encourage spending some time thinking about what that means. So I've, you know, read a lot in the chats of, well, this is frustrating and this is frustrating. Yeah, it is frustrating. Um, and it, it, are you feeling called to do something? Uh, is there a call to engage in a different way? And, and how do you do that? Sometimes it's just, it's simply, you know, I think about it sometimes as simply learning and educating ourselves. For others, it's like, I'm going to take one action today around that to contribute to this because it's important to me. And I, I wonder how, how you both think about this idea around call and how mm -hmm. to, like, it may not be leading a, a spoke or it may not be taking on something big, but what does that mean to you in terms of this work overall? I love that. And, and Jennifer, I've researched and worked and published in the space of women, leadership, and calling. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, even beyond religious research, that when women, you know, men lean into leadership more. Why? It's not genetics. It's the messages we're told. But when women feel, and the research says 30 to 40% more than men, when we feel this deeper purpose or calling, we will lean in and start using our voices. And I, I tell you, I'm doing this work because I feel called. And I think, I think there's a lot of women in Utah who want purpose right now, want that call, not sure what that looks like. If you're one of those people you look at those spokes. I mean, what is calling to you? What are you passionate about? What have you struggled with? What makes your heart leap? What combines your head, heart, and hands? And I will tell you, for anybody listening today, there is space for your voice. There is need for your voice to lean in in your homes, for many people, in your communities, in your congregations. And I'll tell you, exploring just Jennifer, exploring that call um, and, and finding that beautiful space, right? Between the world's great needs 
and um, and our community's great needs and what what connects with the gifts that you have and and the yearning in your heart. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that. That's what I would say beautiful. to offer. Yeah, it's beautiful. I, I wonder, Nubia, I just want to explore a little bit more too with Nubia of it, in that kind of comments you made, Nubia, what's, like, what's the first step someone can take to explore that? What have you experienced? Yeah, thank you for that question, Jennifer. And, you know, I um, I want to acknowledge that, you know, we're all talking about have the courage to step in, um, you know, be bold in your willingness to be a change agent. Um, but there was a really powerful I would say comment in the chat where, you know, one of our attendees shared that mm -hmm. when they did step out, yeah. they were actually silenced and mm -hmm. that they were denied opportunities and that they were rejected. Right. And so I want to just also make room that for happens. Mm -hmm. Right. It does happen. And so the hard truth is that sometimes, you know, as women, we're labeled aggressive, we're labeled, you know, uh, we should learn our place or we're unapproachable. And these labels, and sometimes by women, right? Who cut yeah. us. Yeah. And so I think, you know, the first thing I would say, Jennifer, is, is that if you've had that moment in your journey where you have used your voice and you have been shut down, one moment cannot and will not break you, nor you should, nor should, should you let it define you. I, I implore you lean back in because we need you. Um, create a community of support, uh, whether that's with other women, with allies, with mentors that are constantly reminding you of your value. The first step, however, I would say is um, learn to be in a quiet space where you hold room for your heart and you ask yourself, what is the thing that makes me come alive? Mm -hmm. Is it advocating for children? Is it addressing unsheltered and homeless populations? Is it our aging and elderly, which I will tell you, sometimes are often forgotten. And right now they're experiencing high rates of eviction because inflation is not catching up with how much they have on their social security. Okay. Is it people who are food insecure? I mean, ask yourself because there are so many different experiences that we could be the person that steps in and gives someone hope and light, not through a savior mentality, but because we were created to make our paths lighter by supporting one another. So your first step is ask yourself your why. Why do you want to get involved? Who do you want to serve? And how do you be the light in a world that is in desperate need of it? And the second one is learn to be open about your spaces that need healing, your wounds, your soul wounds that might be preventing you from believing in your capacity to be the leader that we need. So those would be the first two it. steps. I love it. And and that brought up another issue. And I'm watching time. We only have a couple minutes left. Um, but we right now are working on some new curriculum that could go out in various formats. One, just so you know, is around this very topic. So helping women understand their talents, gifts, and strengths. And then when, I mean, the theoretical models have really combined that when women understand their gifts and talents and strengths, and I, I define those differently, then they're more in tune to that purpose calling. Mm -hmm. Like they, they can see that there's this unique giftedness that is only them the way their mind works, the way their experiences that they've experienced, sometimes really hard things, right? But that combination of how they were created, how they were socialized, how what they're learning is every single soul is different. And so we think that's one of the first steps towards, and I use the word in a really positive way, unleashing our voices and our impact and our heads, hearts and hands. So we're working right now with, with some curriculum that can be some online, but some train the trainer. We can give give it to you so you can do it wherever you want. And then the second curriculum piece that we're working on is male allyship. All of us need, and then men need, you know, and men need to teach men, right? On on how what does it look like? Um, sometimes we just say we support you. Men say that, but they're not sure you know, how to go deeper. And, and I was reminded of, I was 
I, I'm just going to bring this up. Um, I was reminded of so much of the research uh, when when I watched the, the movie Barbie the, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, which was interesting in looking at sexism. So um, I'm going to conclude. Oh, my gosh. Have I loved this conversation. Want to make sure and thank our, our funders uh, and always looking for more funding. Uh, our sponsors, uh, especially Utah Education Network, John M. Huntsman School of Business, USU Extension for making this event possible. And in our last need, in our last minute, 15 seconds each. Jennifer, any final thoughts? 15 seconds. I'm going to hold you to it. To use your voice. Oh, great. Nubia, last thought. Well, just really quickly, we do have folks who are asking about more direction on male allyship. So maybe consider having a whole dialogue conversation webinar on that, on getting our men to the table, because we absolutely do need them. But my last thought is thank you to everyone who joined for sharing space as we cried. And, you know, folks were agreeing that they were emotional as well. And this work is hard, but it's it's easier when we do it together. So keep showing up and thank you for what you're doing. I love that. And I'll conclude today with that last slide. I do love Martin Luther King's, um, every society has its protectors of the status quo and its fraternities of the indifferent who are notorious for sleeping through revolutions. Today, our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas and to remain vigilant and to face the challenge of change. And I think in many respects, we have been sleeping in Utah. Um, and, and this is like saying, a bolder way forward is saying, let's wake up. Let's have everybody who really cares about girls and women, hopefully that's everybody, right? So that we can work together to help girls and women in Utah thrive in better ways, which then will lift boys and men as well. We want families lifted in this state and working together is the key. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful day.